Sir, why don't you just basically tell us about some of the books you've written and also some of the documentation of CIA drug running that you've come across? Well, I came to the table with uh, a background in Air Force intelligence, uh, eight years during the Vietnam War, worked with the CIA uh, and Air America. And uh, so I know how the intelligence community functions, how it's organized. And after my discharge from the Air Force, I worked uh, directly with the FBI's counterintelligence division for three years. And then that led me into work, uh, contract work with the CIA in an obscure place called Mena, Arkansas. Uh, back when Bill Clinton was governor and back when George Bush was the president. And, uh, and I personally witnessed a complicity between these two, these two men, Bush and Clinton, in terms of uh, transporting cocaine into the U.S. Uh, for the purpose of sale to generate money to fight a war. And that, that war at the time was the uh, conflict in Central America involving the Sandinistas uh, in Nicaragua. Uh, in 1970, it's well documented that uh, the organization that was flying the classified material for Air America, uh, codenamed Scatback, uh, was busted. This whole, this whole fleet of airplanes and pilots was, was busted for hauling heroin disguised as classified material in an attempt to smuggle that back to Hawaii. And if you get to Hawaii, then it's a free ride back to the United States because that's part of part of the United States. And there's now, no customs to clear. That is documented there, but back to the absolute documentation. Tell us how you how you were involved in MENA with uh, then Governor Clinton of Arkansas and President Bush, who had also been director of the CIA earlier in the 70s. Um, I met Oliver North in 1982. Uh, he was uh, with the National Security Council. He's the man who recruited me as a civilian to get involved in the contra resupply operation. Uh, he told me that this was taking place in, in Mena, Arkansas, that uh, George Bush was overseeing the, the entire project uh, in order to insulate uh, the executive branch from the, uh, from the scheme because certainly there were constitutional considerations there. Uh, I went to Mena, I met a man named Barry Seal, who I was told was the CIA contractor who had the contract to resupply the Contras. Uh, sure, in fact, I found a large base there under construction. Uh, I was hired uh, initially to be a flight instructor. I'm a certified flight instructor. My last tour of duty in Southeast Asia was to assist the Cambodians and equip them to fight a covert war. And uh, here we were doing basically the same kind of training uh, this time we were equipping Nicaraguans to fight communism in Central America. And did you ever actually see the cocaine, or you just were at the base and knew that it was oh, no, being flown I, in? No, I, after, uh, after walking around with uh, blinders on for two years, it became to the point I could no longer deny what was going on. And uh, as I document and discuss in my book, Compromised, it's a book I wrote about this subject, uh, Compromised Clinton, Bush, and the CIA, uh, in 1987, I came face to face with a C-130 full of cocaine, just literally tons of it stored in ammunition boxes on a flight that was returning. And from that point on, uh, you know, I, I couldn't deny it. And I asked for a full-scale investigation and went directly to Oliver North, I might point out, to, uh, to request for that to occur. And uh, the investigation obviously didn't happen. I was labeled a uh, security risk and a threat to the operation, uh, which clearly showed to me that this was uh, being sponsored and sanctioned by the U.S. government. So they were flying guns out and coke in? Yeah. The Heroin story. also? I have, no, I, I have no knowledge of that. It was cocaine. Where are we going now today? Would you say that the majority of, how big a percentile of the narcotics coming into this nation are controlled by the National Security Agency or the CIA? I have no way of knowing, but I use logic on these kinds of scenarios. Uh, if, if you are to believe the Pentagon, and I do, we have a security net over this country down looking satellites and radar that is designed to stop as small of an incoming target as a surface, as an air to ground missile launched from a Soviet MiG out of Cuba. 
Now, if that's the case, and, and you can do that, and I believe we can do that, that's been proven time and time again we can, uh, you have to ask yourself, how are all these drugs getting into this country? So what are the drug busts that we see? Are those cowboys or people that were not inside who are not licensed drug runners for the CI being busted? Oh, the independent, the entrepreneurs, the, the little guys, the guys with a Cessna that gets caught with a duffel bag full and goes to prison for life. The juxtaposition of that is a C-123 with uh, five tons <laughs> coming in unabated. So. How do we stop this? Just education? No. We, uh, we, the American people, first of all, say we don't want a war on drugs. I'm for total mm -hmm. legalization of drugs. Well, uh, pe some people will be shocked by that, but back in the 1920s during Prohibition, Alcohol abuse skyrocketed. It created giant armed gangs. If you make something illegal and risque, a giant black market rises. Well, black market is what the problem is. The profits are there. Uh, take the profit out. And then it loses the flair and it loses the money. <laughs> Not only does it lose that, but anybody else still in the trade certainly surfaces as a cold sore real, real abruptly. The banks that launder the money uh, would surface and probably go bankrupt. It'd be interesting as, a, as an experiment I've always said to, uh, let's, let's say we're not going to do this permanently, but for, for three months, for 90 days, we're going to have a test and we're going to legalize cocaine for 90 days. And just see the reaction of corporations, companies, big businesses that are in the drug business and banks that launder the proceeds and watch them surface because they could not, they would go into withdrawal. <laughs> real abruptly. Well, Mr. Reed, just two more short questions and I appreciate your time with us here today. The general public has a gut level feeling that the information you're, you're discussing is true. Even Esquire did a large article two months ago um, about it in their September issue, um, documenting it, DEA people, carte blanche admitting it. And we've seen articles in early 97 about the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and San Antonio being caught with $3 billion of drug money. This goes to the highest levels. Truthfully, it's good to say we should decriminalize drugs. At the same point, isn't the war on drugs also creating the police state that they like? That's my greatest concern. I don't say let's legalize drugs because I want to see you use drugs or anybody else. Uh, we have not had a war on drugs. We've had a war on our Bill of Rights under the guise of the war on drugs. Uh, I never thought I'd ever live to see the day in this country that I fought for to have roadblocks, arbitrary roadblocks. Now, passengers and vehicles have no rights, as you know, that the passenger has an obligation to show his or her identification. Asset forfeiture seizure. The, the test case before the Supreme Court as we speak is, are the passenger's belongings in a vehicle subject to involuntary search? And I believe the Supreme Court will go along and say, they police have the right to, to stop and and search you and me or anybody else in a vehicle. The Fourth Amendment is worthless. It's been trampled on. It's it's useless. And this is reminiscent of Nazi Germany. Absolutely. So if we want to tr return to a, a nation of greatness, uh, we, we're forced to legalize drugs just simply to preserve our civil liberties guaranteed us under and the Bill of Rights. And then if some idiot wants to OD, that's their problem. Don't take my civil liberties. To me, that person who OD'd is a lot less threat than a group of SWAT team officers kicking down a door inadvertently and shooting the wrong guy. And which, saying it's because of drugs. Absolutely. That's their umbrella. Mr. Reed, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Um, let me, if I may, end my formal remarks there. I don't believe we've got more than five minutes, but uh, Dr. Parker, would be useful if I took some questions uh, here before we leave? General McCaffrey, Alex Jones from KJFK Radio in Austin, Texas. Uh, I fully agree with you on the scourge of narcotics and their destructive uh, consequences on the human brain. But something I find uh, interesting is the massive evidence coming out in the past of our own government and other international organizations' involvement in drug smuggling. In fact, two days ago you, you called Colombia an emergency situation and you're calling for a billion dollars and more funding. Well, your head of counter narcotics and drug operations in Colombia, his wife was just caught shipping in masses of cocaine into the United States. This is from the Washington Post, sir. Also have Reuters is right there, here on it. Is there a question? Yes, that's my question. I just wanted to state my facts because, you know, we're in this world where you ask a serious question, you're a kook. Let's talk about the drug running of this government. Um.
Howard, yeah. I found I got that question was the first press conference I had in Washington was an older reporter. Now watch this diversionary response. He goes into how much he loves the children instead of answering the real question. Oh, and by the way, uh, since my confrontation with General McCaffrey about eight months ago at the time of the making of this film, the colonel has also pled guilty to narcotics trafficking. The head of drug interdiction in Central and South America working for the man on your screen. Let's talk about the drug running of this government. Um, oh, yeah. Last time I got that question was the first press conference I had in Washington was an older reporter. And, and I said, I don't know. I, I've been serving the country for 32 years. I'm not running any drugs. And Louis Free, I don't think, is. I, you know, I, I think the uh, poor... Uh, wife of the Nogar commander in Columbia underscores the problem. Drug abuse and its consequences are not a problem confined to one subsegment of the population. It affects all of us. Corruption, illegality. Four months ago, I you know visited my one of my best friends, lifelong friends. The four of us grew up together in the army. Very senior officer, three beautiful kids. The baby, the baby is 21 years old now. Kid looks like Christopher Reeves, handsome lad. We had a little chat there, the three of us, visiting the two parents and the boy. And he's in a wheelchair with major, permanent, short-term and long-term cognitive impairment and they've chopped away the muscle mass of his right arm and right leg 